Okay, so tonight's lesson, again, it's going to be a combined lesson number one and lesson number two. Plan on being on for one hour on tonight. Let's jump right into tonight's lesson. Before I get into the lesson, I want to at least say this, and that is that I really, I am convinced that God is doing something or getting ready to do something great and spectacular. And and whenever God is getting ready to do something, he literally starts to stir his people uh, and he responds to their prayers. God literally brings you into being a co-worker with him. So God's not just doing things in the earth just by himself, all by himself, even though he can, but he chooses to work through man and with man. And so he places burdens and impresses upon the hearts of people to pray and to intercede, to pray for others, and to pray for the things going on in the earth realm. And then God responds to the prayers of his people. So with that in mind, I want you to, 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 to learn some powerful keys tonight. Grab a hold of some of the keys, and then you can apply them to your own life and to your own, you know, for your own ministry, whoever, and Whoever and whatever you're praying for, I believe that you can apply some of these powerful keys uh, to be able to to have your prayers answered. Okay. All right. Real quick before we really jump in, I'm just going to mute everyone. Okay. Just because we are recording and want to eliminate any background noise. A little bit later, we'll give an opportunity for you to ask questions or uh, make comments. So let's dive right in. Here we go. Uh, keys to effective praying, prayer and intercession. Our launching pad scripture is coming from James, James chapter 5. Starting at verse number 13, is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. And I love this, it's in scripture here. And, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he had committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Here's a direction. God says for us to pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, referring to Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. That's our set of scriptures that we're going to start from. And so here's my first number one key as we focus on that, the portion of the scripture that says, you know, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The righteous man. So what is a righteous person. If you're going to be effective in praying, I believe that it's key for us to understand your righteous position. To understand your righteous position, because here's what Scripture said. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In some translations, it would also say that it makes much power available. So the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man makes much power available. God is responding to the prayer of the righteous person. So let's understand a little bit what righteous means and how do we get it. How do we get to be righteous? Well, according to, if you looked up some definitions of what righteous means or righteousness, a righteous man would be someone who's approved of or accepted by God. Think about that for a second. Someone who's approved of or accepted by God. Someone who is observing divine laws. Okay? And so let's look at scripture from the book of Romans as we're looking to understand our righteous position or understanding what righteousness is, what our righteous position is. 
Romans chapter 5, we start at verse number 16. And the gift, you know, this is referring to, you know, where Paul was making a pretty extensive dissertation pertaining to uh, salvation and talked about how salvation is free. And he goes on and starts talking about, and, and the gift is not like that which came through one who sinned. So a person who sinned did not make this gift available for us. What is this gift? We're talking about it. We'll see it. For the judgment which came from one off offense resulted in condemnation. So we're talking about the first Adam. Condemnation came from the first Adam. Sin came because of the first Adam. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. So this free gift, the end result of this free gift is justification. And justification or justified, somewhat I heard one person even uh, define it as justified, meaning just as if I never sinned. Just as, as if I never sinned. Justification, justified. Let's continue on. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So, Scripture makes it clear that this righteousness that we received is a free gift. And this free gift that we received, which is righteousness, results in the same, which is also justification. So, by right, according to what Scripture says, because of what Jesus has done and what he did on the cross as he died on Calvary, as he rose again, shed his blood, and he rose again, and he entered into the heavens, according to the book of Hebrews. He entered into the heavenlies, presented his body, which is the sacrifice for the sins of mankind, and the blood for the atonement of the sins of man. He presented his body and his blood for the sins of mankind. Now, according to Scripture, I believe it's in the book of John, says, all that believe in him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. So we become God's people. We become God's children. We become righteous. We become justified. Scripture also says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but shall have eternal life, everlasting life. So eternal life comes because of believing on Christ and what Christ has done. For the sins of mankind, when we receive Christ, when we accept him, we become righteous. We become justified. We become sons and daughters of God, children of God. Scripture also says in Galatians that we are the children of God by faith. We're the seed of Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus. We're not children of God just because we're creation. No, we're, we're children of God because of our faith in Christ Jesus. That's what gets us into the family of God, being adopted into the family, okay, because of our faith and belief in Christ Jesus. So this gift of righteousness is something I believe that we should have a really good understanding of if we're going to be effective in praying and interceding. Understanding the free gift of righteousness. Understand, understand your righteous position. Let's continue on in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, as through, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, again talking about Adam, even so through one man's righteous act, talking about Jesus, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. All men, according to what Scripture says, all that believe on him. For as, one, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, talking about Christ, there was a comparison between Adam, the first Adam, and the second Adam, Christ being that second Adam. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And I, and I, and I highlighted those two words, made righteous. So because of our belief in Christ Jesus, we have received this free gift, free gift of righteousness, this free gift of justification, this free gift of being a son and a daughter of God, this free gift. 
what happens in this transition as we were, as Scripture says that we, he brought us out of darkness, translated us from the kingdom of darkness into, into the kingdom of his dear son, and according to the book of Ephesians, he translated us. What happens when this translation that took place? When the translation took place, we were made righteous. You were unrighteous. Now you were made righteous. And you're made, watch this, as we saw the definition of righteousness or righteous. We were made approved of God. We were made accepted of God. Watch this. We're not accepted and approved of God because of our own righteousness. It's not because of our own good doing. It's not because of all the good deeds that we did. It's not because we helped, you know, old ladies across the street or we took care of people or we gave people money. It's not that doesn't make us righteous. Okay? If it's all by works, then Christ died in vain. Okay? According to what Scripture says, if we became saved by works, then we did it. We get the glory. <laughs> but it's because of what Christ has done that it's not of works, but it's because of faith in Christ Jesus that we were made righteousness. If it's by works, then everybody can boast. Look at what I did. No, you can't boast. And salvation as far as what you did, the only thing that you did was accepted Christ. And he, because of what he did, because of the work on Calvary that he did, because of his resurrection, because of his ascension into heaven, because of his presentation of his body and his blood for the sins of mankind, because of the work of Christ, all that believe on him, all that receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. To them gave he the ability to be made Righteous, So we are made righteous, and because we are made righteous, I want you to start thinking about when you go into prayer at night, in the morning, whatever your set time is, I want you to see yourself as being accepted by God, being accepted by God because of what Jesus did, not because of your own works, being accepted by God, being approved of God because of what Jesus has done. Now, we're going to talk about some more things about, uh, you know, purging ourselves and cleansing ourselves and, and departing and confessing our sin. We're going to get to that, okay, because I don't want you to think that automatically we're just going to automatically just be accepted and approved of God by all means and never will God be disappointed us or turn from us or not answer our prayers because of the things that we've done or not done. No, I don't want you to think that. I want you to understand that God has principles, he has guidelines, and he has a right to not respond to your prayer if you're walking in disobedience. Okay? So we're not getting there yet. Just hold tight. Just wanna, I want to I wanna set the stage and make you understand that we have a right and a privilege and an honor to be able to go before God because of what Jesus has done, and we were made righteous because of our faith in Christ Jesus. Therefore, here's what Scripture says, we can boldly come into the throne of grace that we might obtain, may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. When you go to God in prayer, you're able to go boldly, boldly on the fact and the merit of what Jesus has done. Father, I'm here because of what Jesus has done, not because of what I did that was so great and so wonderful. I'm coming because of what Jesus has done, and I thank you for opening the door and allowing me to come before you. What honor and what privilege it is that I'm able to come before you as righteous. And I'm not righteous because of what I did. I'm righteous because of what Jesus has done. He cleansed me, took away my sin, and made me to be righteous. Okay? So that's key point number one is understanding your righteous position. But here's key point number two, as I was just mentioning, I'm talking about seeing yourself as righteous. Seeing yourself, acknowledging, not getting all high-minded and getting caught up in pride and thinking you all that, but no, just understanding who you are in Scripture, understanding what Christ has done in Scripture according to the Word of God, understanding what God has done through Christ concerning you. Now, because of Christ, here's what you have. Here's who you are. Here's what you represent. 
Okay? Because of what Christ has done, you are righteous. You are righteous and you are an heir. I want you to I want you to really grab a hold of this one. Not only are you a been made righteous, been accepted and approved by God, but you're also an heir. Okay, we'll talk about that. Here we go. So here's what Scripture says. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. Oh, I like that. I was, I was reviewing that this morning as I was praying, some, taking some time praying this morning. I said, I said, Lord, here's what your word says. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. So here I am crying out to you, praying to you. Here's also what the scripture continues to say. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and deliver them out of all their troubles. The righteous do what? The righteous cry. The righteous is getting God's or should be getting God's attention. When the righteous cry, God's ears are open. And when God's ears are open and he starts now to respond to their cry, where are the righteous people? These are the ones that are on earth. Okay? And when the righteous on earth start to cry out to God, God is hearing, God is getting, God has their attention. And he is now responding to the prayers of the righteous. He's responding to the prayers of the righteous, meaning he's responding to the prayers of the people that are on earth, where you are, in your situation, in your church, in your community, wherever you may be, in your workplace, wherever you're crying out to God, God is hearing and wanting to respond and wanting to deliver and minister to his people. So I want you to start praying seeing yourself as righteous and as an heir, as an heir. Here's what Scripture says, according to Ephesians chapter 2, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes, who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Look at that. This is, now you're this, but you were that. You were sometimes far off who sometimes were far off. But now look at you. You've been made close to God because of the blood of Christ. He says, now, therefore, you are no more strangers. Before, you were a stranger to God. You were a foreigner to God. But now, you're a fellow citizen with the saints and of the household of God because of believing, accepting Christ Jesus. You are now a fellow citizen with the saints and of the household of God. You've been adopted by God. You're in the royal family. You're in. <laughs> you are in. Here's what Scripture says. Therefore, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You are an heir. I want you to accept that. I want you to receive that according to what Scripture says. See yourself as being an heir. Here's what Scripture says, Romans 8, 17. And if children, talking about you and me, if you're children, then you are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Here's what a description or definition of an heir is is a person who's inheriting and continuing the legacy of a predecessor. Think about that for a second. Jesus was here on planet Earth, and he gave the example of having a relationship and having intimacy with the Father and praying to the Father to be able to get results. Did not he say to Peter and the disciples when they, when they came to get him and, and Peter took out a sword and cut off the man's ear, and he, Jesus says, don't you know that I could, I could literally pray to my father and he will send me, I believe it was what, 12 legions or so of angels? Okay. Just, all I had to do was make one call and legions of angels would come to my rescue. Jesus left that legacy because he even said that, you know, every, all that believe in him, uh, greater works shall we do. Okay, I believe that's in the book of John there. It talks about greater works that shall we do. He left the example for us to follow. We are to be followers of Christ, doing what Christ did, living the example of who Christ was and what he represented. So he left a legacy, and we are to continue the legacy of 
our predecessor, Jesus Christ. So we are a person who is inheriting something, okay, because of someone who died and because of someone who's – there's generally, you know, when, when you talk to – lawyers or, or, you know, when you start planning for future and family and generations and all, you start talking about having a will, having insurance and things of that, things of that nature. Well, you know, the will doesn't go into, it doesn't, it doesn't initiate or nothing is able to transpire until someone dies. Well, Jesus died, <laughs> and, but he rose again. But because he died, now the will, the New Testament, this new legacy kicked in. So we are now able to inherit the things of the kingdom. We're able to inherit our position as children of God as well as heirs of the kingdom. Continue the legacy of the person, one who receives his allotted possession. So there's a lot, an allotted possession that comes to you just because of your stance with God. A right of sonship, that's what an heir is, a right of sonship, a person who inherits or is entitled to inherit the rank, the title, the position of another. Okay? That title has been passed on to us that we are heirs, we are sons, we are daughters, we can call God our Father, Abba Father, like Scripture says. I like this story about Esther. I'm going to read this about Esther because there's a serious parallel here that makes a whole lot of sense to me. Watch this. Uh, grab hold of this revelation. If you recall the story, that I'm going to cut some corners, that um, Esther is part or is the king's new wife, but she's Jewish, and there's been a decree to go out and to destroy all the Jews her uncle was outside and being a servant of the king, uh, but he's on the outside and, and put, put Esther up to saying, listen, I need you to go talk to the king, to get him to change his mind, he's going to wipe out all of us, and he's going to find out sooner or later that you're a Jew as well, and, gonna, and the decree is going to ensure that even you are being put to death. So can you go in and talk to him? She's like, well, you don't understand. There's certain times where the king can will allow people to come and, and address him and talk to him, present themselves before him. Um, this isn't one of those times. <laughs> she says, but you know what? I'm going to go. We're fasting. We're praying. Uh, I'm going to see the king. And if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to see the king. So here it is. She's getting ready to go and present herself before the king and try to turn this thing around. All right, about this decree to have all the Jews annihilated. So Esther chapter 5, it's now it came to pass on the third day that Esther, listen to this, she put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house, over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So that was, a, that was a sign. If that golden scepter wasn't extended, then she couldn't approach. So he extended that golden scepter. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then the king said unto her, What will thou, Queen Esther, and what is your request? It shall be given thee to to the half of the kingdom. What is your request? Look at the parallels here. She put on her royal apparel. All right? Let's now sidestep for a sec, and I want you to think about putting on your royal apparel of righteousness. You've been made righteous. See yourself as righteous. You've been made an heir. See yourself as an heir. Get that mindset. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you that you have the mind that you're able to approach the king, approach your heavenly father, and see yourself as being accepted and approved. Okay? This is all by faith because everything we're doing is by faith. We pray to him in faith. We come to him in faith, believing that he hears us, Believe, because that's what the word says. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. 
Okay. So, so here she is. She puts on a royal apparel, and then she approaches and stands in the inner court of the king's house. So she starts to make her approach, and she's standing there wanting and looking to get his attention. The king's sitting there, and he looked towards her, and she obtained favor. The king extends favor towards her, and he holds out his golden scepter that was in his hand. The extended welcome. Come. Come in and let's commune. The extended welcome. Here's what the extended welcome is that we have in today's day and time. Scripture says, let us come before the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and to find grace. The extended invitation. Jesus also said, gave us a model of to pray, but it's an invitation. Hey, whenever you pray, then pray like this or use this as an example. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's the invitation that we receive, that we have the privilege to respond to that invitation. And this is what she does. She does. She, retain, she obtains the favor. She responds. She draws near and touches the top of the scepter. I wonder, are, are we really, and do we really have that desire to draw near and touch him? To draw near and, and touch him with our faith. We touch him and get his attention. Touch him so that his ears are open unto our cry. And look at what the king says to her. He says, what is it that you need? What is your request? Make, here's what scripture says. Make your request known unto God. The invitation, the open invitation to be able to come before his throne of grace, to be able to call out to him, to be able to, to approach him as him being our loving father who loves us dearly and pray to him, heavenly father, our father which are in heaven, to be able to, 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 be able to go to him, and scripture says, to make your request or let your request be made known. Over and over you see the invitation to pray. To seek God. I believe it's in scripture where God says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He says, Then will I hear from heaven and I will heal the land. So God extends the invitation for us, watch this, for us to join with him, to partner with him, to be a co-worker and co-laborer with him. Linked to what he's getting ready to do or is already doing in the earth realm. God wants you involved. Here's what scripture says. Scripture says, 1 Peter 2 and 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praise of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what happened. You were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are now that chosen generation. You are now the royal priesthood. Sometimes when I, I look at that and I look at other scripture it refers to being a joint heir with Christ, sometimes I go to God in prayer. I says, Lord, I'm coming to you as a member of your royal priesthood. I'm coming to you as a joint heir with Christ. <laughs> I'm just saying what he said. That's what he said about me. I'm coming to you, Lord. And, and hear me on this. This is something that sounds a little silly, but I have to admit that I did it because, uh, it, you know, I needed something to kind of help me. Because I really wasn't seeing myself as the royal priesthood. I wasn't seeing myself as an heir. It wasn't feeling like an heir of God. Okay? So I did something really silly. I went to Burger King. You don't, don't laugh at me now. I went to Burger King, and I said, can you give me some of those, those paper crowns that you give out to the kids there? And, yep, I took one of those crowns, and I went to the computer, and I cut out some little circles with some words in it that said priesthood, royal priesthood, that said royalty, that said justified, that said an heir. And I cut them out, and I stuck them all around the crown, and I put the crown on my head. <laughs> and I would sit sometimes on the couch, you know, around the house, and with that crown on my kids and my wife looking at me like I'm crazy. I know, I know, it sounds silly, but I used to do that sometimes. I get up and I pray, and I went and I grabbed my crown, and I put it on, and I get on my knees and I pray. I says, "That's it, Father, I'm coming to you as a member of your royal priesthood, <laughs> as a joint heir with Christ." Okay, I had to get beyond this barrier in my mind where I wasn't seeing myself as justified or as an heir or as royal 
as someone who literally is getting God's attention that can change things here in the earth. Okay? So as an heir of God, you have been given the right to carry on the legacy of Christ. You've been granted the privilege and access to come before the throne of grace. And here's key point number three, and I've got to move. I've got about another 40 minutes, 45, uh, excuse me, another 30, 25 minutes, 25 minutes, and we have to conclude. Here we go. Key point number three. God moves in response to the cry and prayer of his people on earth. So see yourself as righteous. Understand your righteous position is number one. Understand yourself as righteous. See yourself as righteous and as an heir. Now understand that God moves in response to the cry and prayer of his people on earth. So you are the ones that are is getting God's attention. It came to pass, I'm looking at uh, in the book of, uh, of Exodus, it came to pass in the process of time, that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. Their cry came up to God. They cried, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them, or God favored them. God responded to their cry. Okay? So what is it that's on earth that's causing you to, to make you want to cry out to God? Here's what Scripture says. Psalm 6 says, if I, regard iniquity, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, but verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Okay, we're going to deal a little bit more about you know, getting rid of the sin and all, but because I'm going to do a whole session on reasons why or uh, reasons why prayers are not answered. We'll deal with that. We'll talk about that. Upcoming lessons. Verse 9, but verily, 19, but verily God hath heard me. God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Bless me, God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Are you, do you have that confidence that God hears your prayers? Do you have that confidence that he has not turned away your prayer, nor his mercy from you, and that God is responding to your prayer? Do you have that faith and confidence that God hears you and is responding? The eyes of the Lord upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Here we go, key point number four. Matthew chapter 11. Here's what Jesus, he, he shows us and talks about this pertaining to prayer. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 22, and, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say to his mouth to be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, shall not down his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have those have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, okay, this is also relating to the invitation of prayer. What things whatsoever say what sort of things you desire when you pray. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive as you have ought against any that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So key point number four is to pray in faith. Not only just coming and believing or knowing your righteous position, but now when you pray, when you do ask, here's what Jesus says according to what Scripture says, what things of you desire when you, when you pray, believe that you receive them. Okay? Believe that you receive them. One time I was praying, and, uh, and I'm going through my list of things, and sometimes I'll have some prayer cards written out or some things written out just to kind of help me stay on track as I'm praying. Uh, you know, sometimes my mind starts to wander. I'm no different than many of you. Okay? Uh, my mind starts wandering all different things, and then next thing you know, a whole Thirty minutes have gone by, and it doesn't seem like I prayed anything at all. So sometimes I need to kind of get focused and being able to uh, stay focused in my prayer. So sometimes I'm praying and I'm reading through my prayer cards and I'm, and I'm praying to the Lord. And then one day as I'm praying, and I also like to keep my little journal handy because I'll jot down some things that I believe the Lord speaks to me about. Uh, so one time I believe that the Lord had said something to me. I was convinced and convicted in my spirit about it, uh, and I wrote it down. And the Lord just kind of, you know, brought this back around saying, um, so are you believing that I'm answering these things? <laughs> are you having faith, or are you just going through the motions of praying? I was like, oh, 
oh, hmm, let me think about that for a second. Am I just going through the motions, just praying and doing what I think and what I know I'm supposed to, supposed to do to be able to get changes? But then am I praying in faith? I had to really check myself on that. And I had to go back and say, you know what, Lord, seems like quite a few times here when I'm praying, it's not like I'm praying in faith. I'm just praying or just kind of going through the motions and not really believing that I receive it. Not really believing that I receive. So according to what Jesus says here in Scripture, what's some of the things you desire when you pray, when you are praying, believe that you receive it. Believe that you receive them. The things, plural, that you're desiring, believe that you receive them when you are making your request. As Scripture says, let your request be made known unto God. As you are making your request to God, are you believing that you receive them? And you shall have them. That's what scripture says. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So key point number four is to pray in faith. Pray in faith. Key point number five. I've got two more. Key point number five and key point number six. So out of each lesson, again, tonight's is a ser uh, combined two lessons. Lesson number one, lesson number two. Next week we'll do lesson number three. I'll give you another three key points. But since this is two lessons combined in one, I got a total of six key points. Here we go. Six key points. Key point number five. Here we go. Here's what scripture says. In Luke chapter 22, verse number 4, concerning Jesus when he was praying. Example, Jesus when he was praying. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as if, as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He prayed more earnestly. Now, when you look up the word earnest, you'll see some definitions that relate to praying even harder, praying more earnestly, more intensely, more intensely, more fervently. Remember the, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. The effectual fervent prayer. He, this prayer that was very hard, wasn't that it was difficult to do, but it was it was a hard, it was it was with it was a strong prayer. It was strong with feelings, and it was a prayer with great intensity and feeling and passion. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. When you pray, is there passion in your prayer, or is it some nonchalant type haphazard? You know, Lord, bless me, Lord. I just really thank you. I'm just looking for you to bring healing into my body. Oh, Lord, yeah. Mm. We're, passion. <laughs> Intense. When it says Jesus, he prayed more earnestly. That makes me think that he's praying and then all of a sudden he kicks it up a notch or a few notches. In intensity, he prayed more earnestly. I believe and I'm convinced that you and I could kick our prayer level up a few notches by intentionally praying more earnestly, intentionally praying with more feelings and with passion, intentionally. Jesus was praying as it was great uh, sweats of uh, 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 blood dropping down from his face, from his body. He was so intense in his prayer. Now, I know and we know that this was a time where it was close to his death, but you can see that there was a level in his uh, intensity of his prayer. So key point number five is to pray earnestly. Okay. Here's also what Scripture says. In James chapter 5, as we read this in the earlier part, the beginning part of the lesson. Elias was a man subject like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly. 
that it might not rain. This wasn't some nonchalant, haphazard prayer. He prayed with some passion and with some intensity. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Now, I'm going to tell you, I find myself sometimes, sometimes, many times, not really praying earnestly with passion and with intensity. Sometimes my mind is wandering. And one of the things the Lord just kind of reminded me this morning, this is probably, I probably should include this in one of the keys, but I was praying this morning and uh, every now and then I'll just kind of, sometimes I'll drift off and I'm falling asleep. And you know, as Jesus told his disciples, they were in praying and they fell asleep. And he's like, look, can't you pray with me for one hour? Come on. The, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. And that was the thing that the Lord kind of reminded me this morning. It's like, oh, wow. And I just really had to say to the say, Lord, man, I am, my flesh obviously keeps getting in the way. <laughs> my flesh, is there a way that we can just get this flesh completely out of the way? Okay. And, and obviously, you know, as long as we live in this fleshly body, we're going to have to wrestle with this flesh. Okay. Paul talked about how he said, I, you know, keep under my body and bring it into subjection. I bring this body into subjection. I bring this flesh into subjection. Uh, also in the book of Romans 8, it talks about how the flesh, the carnal mind, is enmity against God. It bumps heads with God's plan all the time. It doesn't want to be bothered with God. It doesn't want to pray. It doesn't want to seek Him. It doesn't want to read His Word. It doesn't want to be intense in prayer. The flesh doesn't want that. And so I had to, you know, as I'm praying, I'm saying, oh my goodness, why? I get it. Okay, God, I'm with you. I'm with you. I got to bring this flesh into subjection even while I'm praying. Even in my prayers, I got to bring flesh under. And I got to keep it under. And I got to let it know that, no, you're not going to interfere with my prayer time because this is something that's powerful that I can bring about changes in my life and in the lives of people around me. I need to be able to do this and be focused, okay, because he's given me that privilege and that honor and uh, to be able to bring change, to be able to co-labor with him, to be able to co connect with God. And join forces with God of what he's already up to and already doing. Okay? He responds to the prayers of his people. But look at this again. Elijah, he did what? He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. What are you praying earnestly? Now, when you pray earnestly, that, I don't know. It may mean that you keep going back to God, not because you don't believe him, not because you don't have faith, but because you are so serious about it and change hasn't happened yet. And I'm here again, Lord, because I'm serious about this change that needs to be done, needs to happen. I believe that you place this burden in my heart to pray about these things. And so continuing on earnestly, here's what the Amplified Version says. Elijah was a man with like passion. With a, with a na nature like us, I'm sorry, with a nature like ours, with the same physical, mental, and spiritual limitations and shortcomings, Elijah was just like you and me, and he prayed intensely. If, if, if you and I were to gauge our prayers, if we had this little needle that can tell whether we are intense or not, if how, how could, could we gauge our prayers and say our prayers have been intense? Our prayers have been earnest. Okay? Scripture says here about Elijah, he prayed intensely. Okay? And he was just like you and I, but he had, had, had made up his mind that he would pray intensely. Prayed hard with great, with, with prayer, dressed to God, intensely, with great zeal, with great energy. Watch this, with great enthusiasm. Is there a sense of enthusiasm and possibly to an extreme degree? <laughs> Is there enthusiasm when you pray? Can people feel the strength of your prayer when you pray? <laughs> Think about that. Look at Daniel. Daniel was a man that was serious about praying to God. 
Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went to his house and he was and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did before time. And these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Daniel didn't care, opened up the windows and they heard him. He prayed intensely, earnestly. Nehemiah, look at Nehemiah, chapter 1, verse 6. Let thine ear now be attentive, and thy, ear, thy eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now. He listen to this. Does it sound like he was earnest? Day and night for the children of Israel, of thy, of thy servants. And listen to else. Does it sound like he was intense with his prayer? Look what else he's doing. And confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against thee. And listen to this. He doesn't say just their sins. He says, both I and my father's house have sinned. Does it sound like Nehemiah was getting a little intense and serious about his prayer? Key point number six, and I'm wrapping it up here. Build a memorial. Build a memorial. Again, you just saw where, where Nehemiah was praying day and night. Where Daniel was praying three times a day. And every time I read that about Daniel and I hear that about Daniel, I have to go back and I have to ask myself and challenge myself and say, how serious am I about these things that I'm praying? Am I praying day and night about these things? Am I praying three times a day like Daniel was doing? I don't know if he had more time in his hands or not. I don't know, but it makes me wonder how often, how serious, how earnest, how intense am I about the things that I'm praying about and am I doing something like this, building a memorial? Now, what do you mean by that? What do I mean by building a memorial? Well, here's what Scripture says, Acts chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house and gave much alms to the people and prayed to God. How often? Always. Always pray. This was a man who was known to be one who gives to people and prays to God all the time. He saw the vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in to him and, and saying to him, Cornelius, now let me just pause there. I want to go back up to verse number two. And it just came to me in a thought, just asking or challenging you and me. Okay, It says it's about Cornelius and pray to God always. Are you, and I'm going to ask myself as well, does people, do people know us to be people who pray to God all the time? Do people know that we are people who pray to God? I was honored, and sometimes I kind of question, you know, what God is up to, and, and you know, sometimes when it comes to certain people, sometimes we... Sometimes certain people may annoy us, <laughs> and when they make requests for us to pray for them, you know, it's like, uh, you know, but I was, God had to kind of, you know, get my attention because the situation arose where a person was had contacted me, and, you know, in previous times, they were just kind of like a bother to me, you know, but the situation was kind of severe in their uh, situation, and um, they asked if I could pray for them, and I was like, well, sure, let's pray. Let's have a word of prayer. And when I started praying, I felt the presence of God. I felt that God was hearing my prayer. And I believe that God is still hearing my prayer. And I believe that God is working on behalf of that person. Uh, I don't believe that it's the end of what, we're, what, what God is. I think God is still doing, still at work doing something changing and moving and pressing upon the heart of that person. Uh, contacted me another time, says, can you pray with me? I said, sure, I'll, let's pray. You know, because I'm, again, know of the situation, and we're continuing to pray. And so they continue to call on me every now and then to, to hey, will you mind praying with me? And then, they, then the person said to me, he said, um, you know, I don't have to look or rely on the people on TV 
you know, to pray for me, I got somebody right here. <laughs> you know, it kind of made me feel pretty good, but, you know, at the same time I'm saying, oh, God, you know, the person really needs your help. They really need your help. So here we go. He saw an angel come to him in verse number four, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? He said unto him, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Your prayers and your alms, your gifts, the things, your good deeds, what you're doing is come up before God as a memorial. Think about that for a second. Are you building and creating a memorial before God? Now, just think about this. And I go to downtown, driving through downtown, I see these memorials, you know, from soldiers that you know, had, had fought in the war, and they built these memorials about them, and statues and plaques and all these different things, you know, big stone memorials. Well, think about this. Imagine this. Here's God sitting at his throne, and he's doing things in heaven and attending to things on earth, and what's starting to build up right near him, right in front of them, in front of him, is this thing <laughs> starts building up, this memorial, this big stone that's got your name and all the things that you're requesting. It's in front of him. No matter, God can't overlook it. It's in front of him. <laughs> He's, it's, and I can just imagine throughout heaven, he's just, the memorials are just, you know, starting to slowly build up all throughout heaven because of the prayers of the people on earth. Are you building a memorial? Is your prayers, are your prayers like a memorial before God? Look at Daniel again. He, he prayed three times a day. He continued to get down on his knees. This is the Amplified Version. Knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God. He continues to do it on a regular basis. Are you building a memorial before God? Again, Nehemiah says, I'm coming to you, Lord, and I'm praying day and night. So here we go as we conclude. Let's just really quickly wrap it up and review as I've got four minutes here. Number one was to understand your righteous position. Key point number two was to approach God in prayer, seeing yourself as righteous and as an heir. You know, the thought comes to me about the prodigal son that comes back to his father. He's all messed up, jacked up, out of money, looking bad, and his father accepts him. He doesn't even see himself as, Lord, uh, uh, Father, I don't even deserve you know, sitting here or eating this time. I deserve to be treated like one of your servants. Look at what I did. I, I deserve to be treated like an outsider and a foreigner. But God says you're not an outsider, an outsider and a foreigner. You're not somebody who's far away. You've been made nigh. So his father took him back in and made him close sat him down and put the, a robe of righteousness on him. <laughs> he, he closed him up with a nice robe, put on sandals on his feet, put a ring on his finger, treated him like his own son, like he normally was anyway, was his son, like nothing ever happened. How about that? Treated him like nothing ever happened. Made a big feast for him. Here we go. Everything is restored back in position like you are. You are a son, and you deserve to Eat from the same table as I do. How about that? We are an heir of God. We get to eat from the same table of God. We get to eat from the same refrigerator. You and God, we, children of God, joint heirs with Christ, we eat out of the same refrigerator <laughs> of God Almighty. How about that? God moves in response to the cry and prayer of his people on earth, key point number three. So understand your righteous position, see yourself as righteous and as an heir. Now know that God hears the cries of his people. Know that God responds to the cry of his people on earth. That's who God's, God places on earth for him to respond to, his people on earth. And key point number four was to pray in faith. 
Okay, don't just go through the motions. Don't just go through it and say, okay, this is a good reminder for me to pray. And then you just go back into, go back into having a mode of praying, but you're just kind of going through the mode. Don't just go through the motions, but pray in faith. Pray in faith based on God's promises, based on his word. Pray in faith. Also, kick up the intensity of your prayer. If it means you got to get loud, if it means you got to sweat a little bit, if it means you got to get dry mouth a little bit, if it, whatever you got to do, if it means you got to watch this, if it means you got to walk through your house pacing the floors instead of laying in the bed, you know, trying to pray in bed and then going to sleep, <laughs> if it means you got to get up and walk around and be intense with your prayer, do what you have to do to kick up a few, kick it up a few notches, and be intense and pray earnestly. And also, again, key point number six is to build a memorial on a continual basis. You're still praying in faith. You're praying earnestly. You're coming to God again. Tomorrow, here I am again, Lord. Sometimes I even say that to the Lord in prayer. Lord, here I am again. <laughs> yes, I am again, Lord. I'm praying about the same thing, but here I am again, based on your word, based on your promises. I'm praying and interceding for a person. Here I am again, Lord, asking for you to move in that person's life, asking for you to meet them, asking for you to break strongholds. And, and here I am again, building a memorial. Okay, well, that concludes tonight's lesson. I'll open up real quick, and if there's anyone who has questions or comments, if you would like, I love to hear feedback from people. Did you get anything out of this lesson on tonight? Anyone? <laughs> 